good air. With special people. Today I have a speaker who, this is wonderful about when I was working in the library, not from my house, but um, I was in the library and this wonderful young gentleman came up and I think you asked for a card or for a book. And the minute I found out what you do, I asked if you could speak here. Um, you're not only a, an author, you're a professor and chair of um, moral theology at Seton Hall University. By the way, hold up your book because that's what I would do normally. Okay. And pursuing the honorable. Um, and when I spoke to you, it's so fascinating what you were telling me in the short conversation. I feel like I know you already and I hope that they will get to know you too. Um, you were so kind, you said yes immediately. And um, the talk today will be on reawakening honor in the modern military. And what we have seen in the last week or two, it's very tragic and um, it's, your talk is more important than ever, honor and, and ethics and whatever. So I do appreciate this so much. And we have a wonderful and bright audience who call in or try to get on the computer. And um, so that's great too. I thank all of you. Um, so it gives me great pleasure now so that we can learn something new. I'd like to introduce Justin Anderson. And um, I definitely think that it's an important talk and I'm so glad you're giving it. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for, for listening. Um, <clears throat> I hope I can broadcast my voice loud enough. So if you, uh, if I'm doing okay, then, 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 then that's good. Um, well, thank you. Yes, I came in. I'll just say a word about myself. Um, and then maybe a, a bit of a story about how I got into this project. I always find that interesting more than people's books, sometimes why they even wrote it. Um, and then I'll give a, a little overcap of, of, of the book, but I don't want to go in too much detail. I told Phyllis as we were setting all this up, you know, I'd much rather speak for a little while rather than go on and on, you know, he had three good chances to stop and he didn't, um, you know, so I'd rather talk for a little while and then we can open it up and we can just have a discussion. And if I need to fill in something I didn't say before, I'd be happy to do that. So, um, so yes, I, I meandered into South Orange um, Library, um, not the usual South Orange Library I meander into, which is up at Seton Hall, um, but the public library down and I, and I bumped into Phyllis one day. And I was actually there to get a, uh, both a library card and a book, one single book um, that my daughter, my now nine-year-old daughter couldn't live without. So I, I hunted it down. I found that I could, because I worked in South Orange, I could get a card. So I came in that day and I bumped into Phyllis and it was a happy meeting. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here. I am, uh, my name is Justin Anderson. I'm originally from Seattle, Washington. So very far away, I feel sometimes. Um, and let's see, I'm, uh, I'm a husband. Uh, my wife is from Belgium, sort of an interesting fact. I did my PhD work um, in uh, Louvain or, or Leuven, um, a famous Belgian uh, university. Um, Belgium is about the size and about the population of New Jersey <laughs> to give you some <laughs> idea of how big it is. So um, just north of France, right? Between the Netherlands, Germany and France and Luxembourg there on the North Sea. and um, so um, I have five children. So ranging from ages 10, uh, 10 and a half, he would say, um, to three. We just celebrated our, the birthday this week of our three-year-old, um, Amelia. So we have one boy and four girls. Um, and, um, and, and we love it here in New Jersey. Love my work at Seton Hall. I originally, as Phyllis said, I. I'm the chair of moral theology. Of course, Seton Hall is a Catholic university, but I actually did my PhD work. I did most of my work, and this book is much more of a philosophical book. So I, I was a PhD in philosophy, um, but it's a long story how I got to Seton Hall. So I won't bore you with those things right now. Um, and this book, that's, that's important to note that this book really is sort of aimed at a philosophical audience. Um, I'm, I'm only the co-author. Um, You'll see that uh, if you see the book there, the, the cover says Kenny McDonald. And, 
and uh, Kenneth McDonald, but <clears throat> he goes by Kenny. Kenny is a professor at West Point. And uh, he came down after he was um, honorably discharged um, from the military. He had spent some time in Iraq and he is a professor of engineering. So he's, he's much more sort of behind in building infrastructure. Um, and, um, and during this time, uh, because I think of his service in Iraq, I think the government had a special program where he could sort of go back to school. And, and he came down and he started to take some classes with me um, in the evenings at Seton Hall. He would drive down from, from West Point um, in New York uh, every Monday, and we would spend the evening discussing. And, and Kenny came up to me at one point, of course, I assigned a, a research paper for this one particular class um, called The Ethics of Virtue. And he said, I, I want to write something, but something that has something to do with military, something that makes sense for what I'm doing. And I said, well, what about this, this idea of honor? You know, we don't talk about honor very much anymore. Um, what about that? And so that began his uh, originally sort of me working with him on a paper. It became an article and then it became a book. Um, so that's kind of what, where our journey's gone. And, and that whole time, obviously, he's been a professor um, at West Point this whole time. So um, I'm on one side with um, the philosophy and Kenny in this book has been on the other side with really the practical experience because one of the things he's done for many, many years at West Point is worked in their honor uh, program. That is how do they shape their cadets to think honorably. And it's a very important work they do because if you think mm -hmm. about it, many times, when military men and women serve overseas, particularly um, in or, or after war, there are no local laws that you can simply follow. So what exactly then is, if you want, your ethical compass in, that, in, in those situations? Does that make sense? If, if we just train rule followers, well, what happens when you find yourself in a situation where there is no legal law? It's been suspended or the government's got something like that. And so you can see there's that, 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 that the importance of inculcating a very strong ethic um, is very important, especially for military leaders. But I would like to say this is obviously this, this is uh, very much looking like the military. One of the first things we say though, in this book in the introduction is, this is not only a book for the military. We don't envision it that way. We envision the military as one instance that we knew best given Kenny's experience that helped us to write about something concrete. But many of the chapters, and, and to be honest, many of the chapters that, that I, I was sort of the main author of have much more to do with what is honor. And I guess I'll just start um, a little bit with that. So that was me. That was a little bit of how I got into this whole mess. Um, <clears throat> I'll say something about the book. The book has six chapters. Um, the first chapter is simply the problems. It's a little bit of the, of the history of West Point. And again, we're just dealing with West Point, if you will, as a case study, not because we think that West Point is the best place to find honor, that um, Western civilization is going to be saved by West Point. That's, that's not our claim at all. Um, our, our claim is simply, well, this is what we know best. And so let's speak concretely about a situation that we know best. So that's really the first chapter. It's a little bit of the history of West Point. We go through various cheating scandals. Um, we love to think of West Point cadets as, as honorable um, the day before they even get to West Point, but they do and they always have had their struggles. And so we talk a little bit about that and why are we having such a difficult time helping these young uh, women and men embrace a life that we would describe as honorable. And so, uh, and of course it's not always bad, right? There's some great success stories too, but that's the first chapter. The second chapter is where I sort of begin to, to cut my teeth a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> we talk about, we really try to go back and say, well, what is honor? What do we mean by it? Um, and it, this chapter is called From Honor to the Honorable. And I get a little, we get a little bit philosophical here when we say, we, we follow mainly our two leading lights here when I say philosophical, are very classical thinkers that have, that have very much enjoyed a lot of a sort of a renaissance in the later 20th 
early 21st century, and that is the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle and the Roman Eurist philosopher Cicero. Um, so we use these two especially in how they spoke about honor. And um, so one of the things that they do first and foremost is when they speak about honor, they always talk about what is honorable rather than the person with honor themselves. Because they say, look, if you're gonna be someone with honor, then you do what is honorable. So it's far more important to ask the question, what's honorable out of a human life? And this is how you can see, we're not just talking about military then. And one of the things, we, we make a few different points here, but one of the things they, they point out is, um, they, both authors, Aristotle and Cicero, both sort of embrace the idea that there are fundamentally three kinds of goods that a human person could pursue. The first is what they call the pleasurable good. We can seek something because it's pleasurable. When I tell my, um, when I tell my students this at, in, in South Orange uh, at Seton Hall, I tell them that this is you know, when you form friendships around the pleasurable good, they only last as long as the pleasure does, right? So this is your beer buddy. This is your beer buddy, right? This is the guy that you want to, you're going to have a beer with, so long as my students are drinking age, uh, so long as you're going to have a, a, a beer with. But the moment that he becomes a little cantankerous, he becomes upset, he becomes sort of a little too intoxicated and gets angry, we're done. Right, I just get up and walk away. The second kind of good that we pursue, says Aristotle and Cicero in life, is that which is useful. That which is useful. And oftentimes our associations and our friendships can grow up around this, where insofar as my friends, quote unquote, my friends are useful to me, they remain my friends. But the moment they cease to be useful, the relationship sort of melts away. So I tell people, uh, my students, again, sticking with the beer buddy, I tell them, this is your study buddy. Remember this person in school? They might not have been the most popular kid in class, but by golly, as soon as the exam was coming up, they were the most popular kid in class, right? So, so this is the person everyone wants to study with. But as soon as the exam is over, the friendship isn't, isn't quite there, relationship isn't quite there. So now I, I should say this, I'm, I'm putting this in sort of bad light. There are times when we do have useful friendships and that's, that's fundamentally what they are. My relationship with my dentist is, is one that is mainly use, right? I go there to get my teeth cleaned. He goes there to clean my teeth and, and get paid. So there's nothing necessarily bad about useful friendships. Of course, the problem is when we're using someone they think we're in to be their good friend and we're really in there just to use them. That, that's where you get in some ethical problems, no doubt. So, so the study, uh, sorry, the, the beer buddy, the study buddy, and there's another set of goods that we, that we seek in life. And these are, and this is the hard part. This is the hard part to translate. It's what Aristotle calls in Greek, the kalon. And Cicero in Latin calls the honesta. And the honesta slowly gets sort of changed as it gets translated into, in some translations, the honorable. This kind of good, rather than being sought for pleasure or being sought for the use, is sought for its own sake and not for necessarily the sake of something else. It's something that we value in and of itself. And of course, we can build our friendships, just like the other two goods, we can build our friendships around this too. This, I tell my students, is your good friend. Some people might say your virtuous friend, the one that you share a common way of life with. And you share maybe a passion or an interest. And it's not just about use. It's not your realtor. It's not your dentist. It's certainly not your beer buddy just about pleasure. There is pleasure here in these friendships, right? The greatest pleasure sometimes are those friends that we just value for their own sake, for just sharing a common way of life with us. There is also use. That is, these are the most useful people, if you want, 
precisely because they're not sought after just for their use. These are the friendships we seek because they're good, right? And so this is where we begin to get our key in Aristotle and in Cicero, what is honor? It is a life seeking the honorable good. It is a life seeking those things which are good in and of themselves. And the beautiful thing about this, these words, kalon, honesta in Greek and in Latin, is they can get translated in so many beautiful ways. Beautiful, a beautiful life, a fine life, right? A virtuous life, a life that is good in and of itself, a morally good life. All of these things, a sort of becoming or fitting life, all of these are ways that, that English language authors have tried to translate this word where all of these different ideas come together in one, the honesta or the kalon in Greek. So this is what it means. This is what honor means. The way we're defining honor in our book then is a life lived for the honorable. And that's important because what many people think of as a life living, being lived for honor is a life being lived for being praised. That's a very different notion of what we're thinking about. And what we use is a beautiful quote from Cicero, the ancient Roman, to get at this. And what he says is, he says, the honorable is doing that which is he says, honor is living for the honorable, even though no one praises it. Even though nobody praises it, it's still doing that which is honorable. So that's, I think, a, a beautiful way to think about that second chapter. It's got a lot of meat to it. Our third chapter, our fourth chapter, and then I don't want to carry on too long. Our third chapter says, what happened in our sort of Western intellectual tradition if there was Aristotle and Cicero, the great Romans, the ancient, uh, the ancient Greeks, we've inherited so much from them in the West. And when I say, say West, West I, I'm mainly thinking of sort of um, the Atlantic Ocean, both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, if you will. Um, uh, what happened? Why don't we use, why don't we easily speak about honor anymore? Have you ever noticed that? Um, I was rapping with Phyllis last week and I said, you know what we do speak about? We speak about dignity and we speak about rights and very good. My, my co-author and I certainly don't want to get rid of those at all, but we find it curious that we stopped roughly about 500, 400 years ago in our, mo in our most common way of thinking about our lives as speaking about honor. We retain this word honor for sort of special professions usually, right? Where we expect there, at least expect there, and here we'll get to some questions when we talk, right? Whether we're talking about politics, politicians. I love that, what was that? I love Jimmy Stewart. I don't know if there's any Jimmy Stewart fans out there, but the old right. Mr. Smith goes to Washington, right? You sort of, this sort of beautiful sense of a sense of honor that he has that, that he's, that, that, that this uh, political life involves himself in. Um, whether we're talking about firefighters um, and certainly military, we sort of, today we reserve honor for these, these sort of fields, these sort of ways of life, but we don't oftentimes think about it our own way. We usually think about dignity. We usually think about rights and that's good. And that's good. But what happened? So chapter three sort of dives into a little bit of history. And really what we come to is in following other uh, much smarter uh, intellectual scholars, um, we really come to say, well, what happened to honor? Some people say it died at the Somme uh, on the battlefield of World War I, it died. Uh, some people say, well, it died in the French Revolution. So there's different authors with different theories out there, but uh, one of the people that, um, that, that we look at, um, he, he talks about honor as being eclipsed by dignity. And this is an, in an important way. The moment we started to think about ourselves more as radical individuals than we did necessarily part of a community. 
Does that make sense? So if I think of myself, for example, um, uh, I'm Justin Anderson, right? First and foremost, I think of myself as this. And then somehow I think outside of that of, well, what community am I gonna, what community do I belong to? Do I wanna to belong to? And a lot of authors today are saying, actually, that's not how we work. That's not actually how we work. That's, a, that's sort of how some authors about 400 years ago, uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, John Locke, for example, started to think about as radically individual persons who then have to have a reason to join a community. Social contract theory, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, if any of you know this. But, but how we actually work is that we were born into a community. That when I get on a Zoom call with people I've never met, one of the first ways I introduce myself is that I'm a husband and a father. It helps you sort of understand a little bit of, of who I am and rightly so, right? And so honestly, community and a communal life is much more part of what it means to be human than sometimes these early authors sort of gave it to us. Now, dignity, dignity as an ethical word can survive in a radically individual context, but honor cannot. Honor like shame, the opposite of honor, usually involves us in some way with being face to face with other people. Does that make sense? So why, it's great that we have, we, we talk about dignity and rights, we need that. We don't wanna get away from that. We wanna synthesize that. But we also wanna recognize and maybe in some way talk about honor as something meaningful that, that I can reattach to my life, if you will. And so it's important to talk about our community relationships, in fact, if we're gonna talk about living an honorable life. Chapter four, and I, I'm, I'm going, I'll, I'll finish here. Uh, uh, chapter four goes through about 10 things, 10 conditions that we need to reawaken or alter if we want to recover language about what it is to live an honorable life. And the first condition is to be able to understand ourselves as at least in some aspect of our personality, necessarily a part of a community. <clears throat> what we call, what other authors have called a practice, a social practice. And so in the fifth chapter, we turn back to the practical of West Point. And we say, given the modern military then, and given what we say, how can we instill honor in the young cadets that are coming to West Point? And we go through some very practical suggestions and how we tell history, how we teach history to them, that we indicate to them what is honorable behavior, even in the narration of military history, which is a class and a course they go through. Or for example, how we treat and we should treat how we have not acted honorably and treat it as something that is not honorable. Does that make sense? So. What I guess what I'm sort of getting at is here is uh, the, the nub of what we're saying is following Aristotle and Cicero to live an honorable life is to live a life with the virtues. In particular, right reasoning, right? Right thinking, justice, right? In our, in our heart, in our will, that we're just, that we're predisposed to give each person what is their due, all right? Courage to be able to stand up and to stand for the good, even when it means we're in a difficult spot because of that stance. And then finally temperance, to make sure that we're not sort of gluttons and drunkards or something. We're, we're, we, self, we, are, we are beings and agents who are self-possessive. And it's when we're self-possessive that we can really pour our life out in service to those that are around us. So um, the sixth chapter is really just a conclusion. Um, but that's the book. I better stop or I'm afraid uh, most of the people I can't see on the telephone call will be asleep. So, no, uh, <laughs> no, you're fascinating. You're fascinating. That's it. But let's, oh. I mean, we can certainly, yeah, Phyllis, I know we want to talk about some questions, so. Okay. I'll ask the first question um, or, or say, what, what we consider honor, 
Um, there's a Yiddish word called mensch. If you're a mensch, you're a fine, upstanding person. And um, I'm, I'm afraid that now things, not only in politics, but in um, every field that people would look up to, the, um, the clergy, the doctors, the physicians, uh, things have changed and people have gotten, um, I, I don't know what the word is, but the, the honor, you know, mm -hmm. like you say, West Point, West Point really did always have the highest standard if you came yeah. from West Point and you knew who fought the, the wars and, and, and um, but they stood, they stood strong. And I'm afraid now um, society is not seeing the honorable as much as they, they see right. dissension. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this really for me goes goes back to that history chapter because one of the things that we see more and more, um, and certainly there are very powerful and interesting forces behind it. I mean, and I don't wanna be condemnatory towards all those forces. There are some things we need to pay attention to in our lives, but really what it comes down to for me, Phyllis, and we say this in the book, is that we have become people who understand very well um, the, um, the goods of pleasure. We've become people that understand very well the goods of use. Remember those three goods we talked about? And if anything, um, especially that last one, use, that really we begin to see um, other people and even, even the environment. I mean, really what we look at as far as an ecological uh, difficulties that we're in, in our world today, oftentimes stem from our idea that we can simply use something and throw it out. And I don't just mean literally in the trash can. I mean, that's sometimes how we treat other people too. And so I would say that really for me and for Kenny, what lies at the nub of this, at least part of the answer, at least part of the answer is to reawaken the idea that there are some things which are good in themselves and are worthy of pursuing in themselves. Even like, like Cicero says, nobody else will praise them. Nobody else sees them as useful. And I think we become a culture widely, again, in the West, where we are very, uh, as scholars would say, utilitarian. We're very much into use. And so everything becomes a little bit of a game of how can I get what I want from this situation, from this friendship, from this relationship, from these politics, from whatever, and less being invested in the people that I'm surrounded with, if that makes sense. So I would go back to that difference between the, the useful good and, and, and the honorable good. And I think we need to reawaken our vision for that. I, I have a question. Please, um, yeah, Tracy. Yeah, the concept of, of uh, the three types of good and things being just good themselves. And you're speaking, I think, just from a scholarly perspective with regard to behavior, <clears throat> excuse me, especially in a military environment. Um, how you, um, being part of a Christian organization, how do you relate that to our... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, our decline, it seems, as Phyllis noted, in any adherence to the being in it just for the good of the good, um, to the fact that we seem to be um, losing our perspective on religion and the concept of the virtuous nature of being in a religious community, embracing religious concepts, and then um, not just for embracing, but acting on them, being good in your community, being good in your, um, in your family, being good in everything you do, focusing on what you can bring to the table to offer to others, as well as what they bring to the table to offer you and the general community. Yeah, I have a great question, Tracy, and, <laughs> and, and thank you for asking it, because half of me just wants to jump and talk a lot about, you know, this sort of thing, so I got to be careful. So, yeah, First off, absolutely. What about this religious context? I mean, one of the things we point out in this book, and it's really, really interesting, once I started researching some of the authors in the early modern times, um, one of the things we point out in this book is that any one of our conditions to reviving honor is any real sense of honor needs to at least be open to the transcendent. 
it, and that's the way we put it sort of in philosophical vogue, but needs to be open to that religious spiritual dimension of the human person. And I think it's really important. In fact, it's essential that it is. Um, it's interesting, one of the authors in that early modern time that explicitly wrote and argued against honor was the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes. And it's interesting how he did that, Tracy, is the way that he argued against it was by saying that people who live for honor will go to their death for what is good in itself. And it is not politically expedient for us starting a new state to have people who will stand that strong. And therefore, I know, and so there's really this sense of like, let's remove this transcendent dimension of that honorable good, specifically in light of the religious dimension, the spiritual dimension of the person. And um, now, to be fair to Thomas Hobbes, he was looking at some people and he thought some people were being very selfish. They were just being honorable just to get the praise. But he did note that there are some people who will go to their death. And his argument was, his book was called Leviathan. And the monster, uh, the biblical image of the monster out of the, out of the sea. But he saw Leviathan as the supreme absolute commander, the king, at the time the English king, of the political realm. And that commander needed so much control of his or her subjects that anyone who would be willing to stand up against the king, even to the point of death, had to be done away with. So if you can imagine, so there's even historically in our tradition, there is this sort of how does honor cash itself out, if we want, against this religious dimension. I, coming to today, I think we do need a sense, obviously, I think I, I think we all can, can hold up and say, uh, you know, you see this in, in wonderful good stories in the military of men and women who have done amazing things, risked their own life, or even died saving other people's lives for no other reason than simply they wanted to protect them. You know, so, um, so I, I would say that this is something very real today. I think as far as the religious side outside of military, even today, some authors, um, one of the most strongest um, secularists, and he calls himself a secularist, he's a German called Jürgen Habermas, which is a name I greatly enjoy saying. So I'll say it, Jürgen <laughs> Habermas. It has nothing to do with the hand cream. Um, no, so you know, you know what, one of the things was he, he advocated and he said, look, religion is on the decline, religion's on the decline, it's going away, it's going away, it's going away. And then September 11th happened. And about three weeks after September 11th, he's a, he was an older scholar at this point, and he had all his many disciples around Germany, around the world. After September 11th, he stood up about three weeks later at a book presentation, and he basically argued against his entire career. And he, he's not a religious thinker now. He's still very much a secularist, but he said, as a secular person, we need to realize that religion is not going away. Maybe the spiritual manifestations that each of us have change, but it's a dimension that we have that we can't just simply dismiss out of people anymore. Does that does that make sense? So how should we live? I mean, one author has said, okay, there's many people, some people believe in God, some people don't believe in God, some people are agnostic and say, I'm not quite sure, and I don't know if I could ever know, right? We have all sorts, but perhaps can, this was a religious author, by the way, he said, can we live in a way as if God existed? Can we, can we all agree that it's a more humane world if we live with just the what if God existed, can I then treat my, my sister or my brother that I see as someone well worth um, the attention that as an honorable good, not someone just to be used? Uh, I'll leave it there. But boy, Tracy, thanks for the question. I could keep going on and on. How do you see leaders now being honorable? in today's world, when the leaders in foreign countries as well as our own are not showing the dimension of love and understanding and, and humility. 
thank God we, we are now going to have someone who has those traits. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I, I can't figure out everybody, everything all at once, so I won't try. Um, but I would say this, um, you know, some, someone just said to me, a wonderful professor, uh, he, um, uh, up at Seton Hall, uh, Italian fellow just said to me this last October and it really resonated with me. He said, say the word that you're given to say and do the thing that you are given to do. God bless you. And in a certain sense, I think what he meant by that is it's okay to start small so long as we start. So my first thought, Phyllis, is, is for myself, um, oftentimes uh, I teach, of course, uh, Christian ethics uh, at Catholic University. Oftentimes we talk about the home as being the school of virtue. I think that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful way to think about what a home can be. And again, you're talking to someone who's got, you know, 10 years old down to three. So I'm naturally thinking of sort of young children here. But that's, you know, we have in my house, we have a little virtue wall where we try to put up a virtue each week. And we try to focus on that. And we try to direct, you know, we're, we're, we're Catholic. We're trying to direct our prayer, you know, help us. to. So this week right now, um, this will give you an insight into our where we're at as a family. We're, we focused on speaking kindly to one another, right? Because coming off of the break when all the kids were home, we, you know, pretty soon the, the energy would get up and up and up. And so every single one of us from dad, mom, all the way down to the three-year-old, we just talk about, you know, for the three-year-old, it means learning to say please. You know, keep keep reminding her. You know, um, for for our older kids, it means being patient with your younger brother, uh, your younger sister. So, um, I, I think we got to start at the home, um, and and we got to start in our schools, and we got to start in the little places that we have community, like uh, like the library. You know, I mean, it strikes to me that I'm I'm in front of a community in some ways, right? Because here are people who know each other. I don't know who it was. It was one of the phone numbers in front of me that said we recognize each other's voice. I, that's a beautiful way to describe what's going on here is that here are people who, rec and think about that, it's quite profound. Someone who recognizes your voice. Um, that's beautiful. I, so I think we have to start here. Um, and, and then yes, I mean, certainly there are, there's, there's very difficult forces anytime you throw in money and power. Um, from what I hear from people who work in international diplomacy, you know, those sort of things are, are always oftentimes behind our, our big, our big problem sometimes is, is, is money and power. But I mean, you look at that money and power, again, where would we put those? Pleasurable goods, useful goods, goods in themselves. Most people wouldn't say they're goods in themselves. Most people want money because of a sense of security it gives them maybe. Um, if they use it, in other words, for something else. Some people want power because they want to do something else, et cetera. So I think we really need to come back to this idea that the, the people in front of me start small, are something that is an, what I might call, a, for lack of a better term, a, an honorable good. Something, have their own dreams, their own hopes, their own cares, and we need to pay attention. I don't put myself, I put myself at the service of that reality, not as it's commandeer. For my own purposes. I don't know how to answer all the questions, Phyllis, but I'd throw that one out there. But you're right. I think, I think in politics, we can talk about honor. And I think we have to, because politics for us has become a dirty, dirty, you know, someone goes into, it's, it, it's a dirty thing now. And it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be. So I, I, there's a few different hands going up. So uh, Zia, go ahead, Zia. Um, I was just going to ask you about the most recent incident, since you mentioned politics. Mm. Those soldiers who were pardoned after they had killed a number of Iraqis. Mm -hmm. I just wonder where military honor fitted into that situation. And do you think it would have been honorable for them to refuse the pardon, mm. which is a tall order? They're human beings. They're more mm -hmm. concerned about their own mm -hmm. life and security. Mm -hmm. But do you think honor fits into a situation like that? Yeah. And uh, I would also ask you to um, spell the word, the Greek word. Oh, yeah. How would Kalon. You spell yeah. Kalon, right? Yeah. It's K-A-L-O-N. Okay. 
K A L. Is the way it sounds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. So. Okay. Great. So. Uh, first off. Um, yeah. In in our book, um, it's not holding up the military as an institution that is always honorable, and it's not holding up the military as an institution that's never honorable. I should say that. Like most things in life, it's right. Like most of us, it, it's a mixed bag. And certainly there are, and, and we detail failings in the history of West Point specifically of just cadets who were there, never mind graduates, um, of failings in honor. Um, but we also start the book with the, the true story of what became a famous Hollywood movie uh, from the actor Wal Mark Wahlberg. And it, it's a movie called Lone Survivor. Um, but it's the story of four special forces, US special forces that were sent on a reconnaissance mission in Afghanistan, in rural Afghanistan. And all they were supposed to do was to survey and find out if one of the, one of the major leaders of, uh, of a terrorist network in Afghanistan was in this small village. And in the middle of their reconnaissance, um, some shepherds stumbled upon them, an old man, a middle-aged man, and a young boy. And they took them captive, right? They kept them there and they debated, what should we do? This is a sort of a, you'll see this in the movie, uh, although it's a bit, of course, dramatized. Uh, there's a book out about it. Um, long story short, they decided that they cannot kill them and they, they, they cannot do anything but let them go. But of course, letting them go probably means they're gonna get the Taliban coming up the, the hill in waves. And sure enough, long story short, that's what happened. Three of the four men died and only one made it out after several days. But one of the things that saved him, Zia, was actually the honor of a nearby Afghan tribe he was found by a small group, uh, a man had come down to the river and he was found about two days later. And out of their own ethic, this, this, uh, this Afghan tribe, this gentleman said he took him under his protection and even the, the town was willing to go toe to toe with the Taliban who then found out where he was and not give him up. And so it's a beautiful story of actually the fellow who lived through this and the town in Afghanistan, the village really that saved him. Um, but it's interesting to note that honor is not just about military. And in fact, in wartime, um, I think one of the great things about that story is it brings to life how every single human, every single being out there in a, in a theater of war, as the military would say, is human. And uh, one of the great things about this story is just that. So yeah, coming back to Afghanistan, coming back to Iraq um, and, and the crimes committed, because that's what they were. They were injustices committed against human beings. So what should we do with injustice? Well, one of the ways we described the honorable good was to live a just life. And so to, to be a person of justice. So first off, the crime obviously should have never happened. Mm. But how do you then remediate that crime? Um, and as you said, would it be a tall order? I think it has to be a tall order, but I, I would hope that every single one of those, um, those soldiers of ours that, that, that committed this crime um, would, would recognize that first off, what they did was unjust and, and the way that they're being treated is in a certain sense, not completely just either. Um, being let off or whatnot. Now, um, now um, we could say a lot more about clemency, about part, you know, the pardoning, we'll see. But, but nevertheless, I think we have to at least start from the premise that what we look at is to be just. Um, would it be a tall order for them to, you know what I would hope? I would hope that, um, so they've been pardoned or whatnot. I would hope that they spend the rest of their life in service to other people. 
I would hope that they would that they would realize that what they did was wrong. They've been pardoned in a way that they sh they they by all accounts of justice shouldn't be. And that who knows, perhaps they could even go back to Iraq and spend their life in service to the Iraqi people. I don't know. Maybe that's a tall order, <laughs> but. Um, Yeah, I guess I'll stop there. I don't know if that's if that's very if it's a very good answer, Zia. But I think we have to start. Yeah. I just feel that if you consider honor, honor certainly died the day they were pardoned. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I I think I think that there is something. Um, I think there is something. I, I, yes, I I. I believe that justice and the punishment that comes from wrongdoing, if it's right, if it's if it's right, right? We're not talking about um, uh, punishing someone who's innocent. We're not talking about punishing a person disproportionate with, uh, with their wrongdoing. Um, if we're presupposing that it's a just punishment, then I actually think that it's helpful for the person to undergo it. It's not pleasant. That's the very definition of pain but that it's helpful, yes. And in a certain sense, um, Zia, I think we have to say that ultimately we're not even being helpful to the people who were pardoned. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Myra, please. Yes. I, th throughout, I kept thinking of the four years we've just been through. Mm -hmm. And um, that the people of honor were those, were the whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. And the Ukrainian uh, American who was hounded so, and his life was threatened so that he had to give up his career just for safety. But just having been through such a traumatic traumatic period in this past administration where everything that we held dear, what, that we thought was honorable, mm -hmm. seemed to fly away. To have these individuals, and there were many of them, be so brave as compared to the those who wouldn't stand up to what was obviously so wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't such a, this isn't a question exactly, but just that people of that level of character just are honorable in all the ways that you have described. Yeah. And I'm just hoping that now that we're entering a new era, we can get some of that back. We can get to the point where most people are like that, not few people. And that's a tall order. I, I mean, I, I agree it is. I, I, think, I think that our instinct is right here though, that, that culture and law help us. Well, they're supposed to help us, I, we, right? They're, they're powerful forces that can drag us down or hold us to a high standard and when you look at something like West Point, that's what we're talking about. I mean, think about the lives of these young women and men who become cadets at West Point. They really go up there um, their first year and they're living right there. It's, it's not back and forth to home. It's supposed to be a place where of all places you can sort of begin a culture. Someone asked me recently, I thought a wonderful a wonderful question to start. And he said, who's your hero? Who are your heroes? And I thought, what a, what a wonderful way to sort of, we were sitting around just, uh, well, not sitting around, you know, today, but about talking uh, via Zoom and, and just being able to share life a little bit and, and say, you know, who's your heroes? And what a great conversation starter you know, um, and how much we discover about one another when we just talk about our heroes. And heroes serve, um, if you want, a purpose in our society. We need people. We will always need people. Someone who's risen above the fray of normal human life, 
that we can look at for if for no other reason than they become a person who for a moment, and maybe not in every aspect of their life, right? Let's be honest, maybe not in every aspect of their life, but, but they become a person we can hold up and say, I should be, let's be more like her or him. You know, um, I have my, my son, I've mentioned is 10. I think a lot about moral formation and moral development with kids, uh, probably because I'm a father and I'm also talking about ethics and morals all the time. But, you know, in just really simple ways. And a lot of times um, I'm from Seattle, we're big Seahawk fans. Um, we talk about sports figures, you know, and, and it's wonderful to be able to highlight really, really good sports figures. You know, oftentimes you always hear the bad news, but there's some great sports figures out there. I mean, one of the people that we talk a lot about, um, if you're any Seahawk or football fans, you'll get it, is Russell Wilson, the quarterback of the Seahawks. I mean, just a really stand up young man, hard worker, uh, team promoter, encourager, seeing the good. I mean, these are the sort of things that, that, that I try to, but I think we all need heroes and our society needs heroes. Um, so I, I, I think that, you know, certainly that's one thing you see in the military, right? Isn't that the whole point of having a medal? I mean, not just, not just uh, why do we even have the institution of giving medals to people? And we always have, back in Cicero's time, they would certainly. Because we're able to hold people up and say, you see, at least in this moment, in this circumstance, in this way, this person is to be imitated. And I mean, this is one of the great things about sort of, I'm looking at Tracy going back to sort of the religious side. I mean, obviously in the Catholic church, we talk about saints. It's another way of basically saying heroes, you know, uh, people of, 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 of a religious tradition, whether that be in the scriptures or whatnot, they be, can become people in the past. I was just today, I, I was just a few days ago, I was talking about Cincinnati. Cincinnati, Ohio is named after the, the Roman Cincinnatus the one who had all the power and walked away from it. And it reminded the early uh, founders of America about George Washington. And so Cincinnati, Ohio is, is a, basically named after George Washington in a way because there were no limits on the presidential terms at his time. And he just put it down and said, I'd like to go back to Mount Vernon and just enough is enough. And same with this ancient Roman. He actually had a watermelon farm. He said, enough is enough. I want to go back to my watermelon farm. So my kids love this story, but that's, that's it. I think we need heroes. Thanks, Myra. I have one more question. Yeah, yeah, um, Tracy. And I, I had to step away for a minute because my daughter called, but I've gotten off the phone with her and you may have talked about this, but it seems that the first two goods you, you described, the good, the good for fun and the good for some sort of benefit. Yeah. Um, they both seem very transactional. Yep. And um, it seems to me, and given I'm not a scholar of any kind, but that our society has become very transactional. Yep. That we're all about what we can get in this moment, you know, self gratification, immediate gratification, um, the concept of using, you know, people or using things to your own benefit. It seems to kind of outweigh the concept of doing good for good. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know how we actually get away from the transactional nature of our society. And I think that, and I agree with you that it all starts at home. I shouldn't say it all. I think it needs to start at home because we need to teach our children properly how to not just treat each other, but to treat people, other people and how to be a good person in the world. Yeah. That's what we're accountable for as human beings to be a good person in the world. And good takes a broad spectrum, um, includes a broad spectrum of things. You know, it's good behavior good treatment, do good things, um, get good results. I mean, good is, is very broad. Um, but what I see people, I shouldn't say people, what I see our society doing is using the concept of being a good person in society, if they even think that way, meaning to get as much as you can, as often as you can, regardless of who may be um, damaged or pushed aside in the process, and then use whatever you get to get more of what you want. And how do we get beyond that notion of number one, um, it seems that we're worshiping things mm -hmm. more than worshiping good concepts and ideas these days. Mm -hmm. um, and technology is a big piece of it to a certain extent, but technology hasn't existed forever. 
and we've been down this path for a long time, at least I think we have in a transactional nature. So, you know, how do we move away from this transactional society, which is reinforced on television with commercials? I mean, it's reinforced almost everywhere you turn to a society that truly is more, I don't wanna say egalitarian, but one in which we really are concerned about our neighbor and don't just maybe give lip service to that concern, but actually take action and be actively involved in addressing those concerns. Yeah, yeah, great, great question again, Tracy. I mean, so I, I mentioned something about this. I'm not sure if you if you heard it. Talked a little bit about about this, but this is a great question because this is well, what can we do, right? What positive thing can we do? So, I mean, first off, I'd say, um, oftentimes, I don't know about you, become I become overwhelmed with sort of the bad news out there sometimes, and I find myself becoming cynical, and I think one of the one of the great things that we can do is to challenge our self-cynicism, to challenge our cynicism in other people and challenge the fact that, oh, it's never gonna get better. Or this is just the way the world is. Because by believing that story, we give ourselves an excuse to start acting that way. So I think beginning to realize, no, That's we can true. actually change our culture. We can actually change, we can go from where we are now to someplace better, you know, and we're actually, it's actually really possible to do that. Um, so I would say that, and, and this is, this is going to go, it'll reveal a, a little bit, again, my, my sort of religious stripes, but I, I'll make it a little bit wider. But I would say one concrete thing that I do in my house, and, and it does touch on technology, but it also just touches on a few different things, is we really try to, um, you know, we're Christian, so we try to set aside Sunday. I mean, that, so it's, it, and, and I know whether you're talking, we've got a wonderful Jewish community here. So whether you're talking about the Sabbath on Saturday, our, our Muslim brothers and sisters who celebrate Friday, whatever it might be to have one day of the week, where if you think about that, as far as just, again, that religious tradition, the whole idea of behind this sort of impetus is make sure you're taking this time, this day every week to, to do what? Not to work. Um, not to be after what I can get. I mean, let's take it a little bit deeper. It's not just about not working. It's not, we're not worried about what I can get, what I can do, what I can have for myself. It's a day of the week where we can sit back and say, there are the bonum honestum. There are the goods in themselves in this world. And today I'm going to sit in the presence of those people. I'm going to sit in the presence of the divine. I'm going to sit in the presence of these, and I'm just going to not have to consume and devour these things in a, in a pleasure sort of way, not in a useful way to see what I can get out of it, but simply because the human spirit needs a weekly rest from all of the busyness that we do. So I think inside of our religious traditions, and I would, again, encourage us, whether you're religious or not, whether you describe yourself as, as believer or seeker or whatever you might say, I would encourage you to take that sort of footnote, well, more than a footnote from these religious traditions, these great religious, I think it gets to something that he, the human spirit needs. And again, I try to do that, you know, in, in the Christian environment, in our home, every Saturday night, as we begin Sunday, we, we sort of set aside and say, hey guys, this is Sunday. This is the beginning of Sunday. We're going to set this day aside. And that means that you're not going to go running off to your friend's house. It's a little bit more of a family day. That means, you know, we're not going to be on technology. I know Tracy's technology is part of it, but not always. But we can at least limit this just for a little while here. And, um, and so I think that's a, that's a good thing to do. Um, and, and I think finding places and avenues in our lives where maybe we can't do it all at once. We can't change every day of the week and everything. And maybe we don't need to or want to. But maybe just to find that little time to set aside. Um, is a good thing, and maybe every day to find those 10 minutes just to where I don't need to be grabbing at my phone because it beeps or whatever it might be. So I hope that's, I, 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 I know, you know, I forgive me, I'm, I'm sort of the Christian ethicist here, so forgive me for the plug, but I think the, the great religious Abrahamic traditions do have something to teach us, and it's about what it means to be uh, humanly healthy whether we're a believer or seeker, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. I think we need to slow down. When we slow down, we can listen, and then we can become more attuned, not to the pleasure, not to the use, but just to the good in itself. 
Well said. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Phyllis. And I think that's what we have to do. It, it was fascinating. I really appreciate what you, what you have said. And um, it makes such a great deal of sense because actually what you're saying is you're not looking for pleasures for yourself. It's the pleasures, it's, it's the giving that you could give to others to make their lives happier and healthier. Yeah. So thank you, My, Justin. Hey, thank I, you all. I, mean, I appreciate Well, let me say I'm honored, if I can say that, just to be brought into, <laughs> again, what I say is really seems like a, a community to me. So I, I'm, I'm really encouraged just to, to meet everybody here and uh, whether I see your face or not. So I wish you, wish you all the very best for 2021. May it be light years better than 2020. <laughs> light years. And the same to you. And I hope to see you in the library again and, and we'll have good talks again. Thank you again for everything. Bye -bye. I said one, uh, one comment.